So we are in session 18 today. We'll have uh, some more into system.collections namespace. So in this we'll see what is a sorted list. We'll see specialized name value collection. We'll see an overview of a debug print and assert statements. And we'll see the system.collections.generics namespace and uh, what its significance and some of the overview. And also we will look into the generics collection in detail and also we'll see how to create a generics classes and how to, uh, what are the constraints we have on top of the generics as well. Okay, and uh, we'll see a, some kind of a summary of uh, the dictionary, a generics in a dictionary uh, which takes a, a type parameter of T key and T value. We'll see a generics list of T and we'll also see an overview of uh, Q of T, which is generics Q and uh, uh, a generic stack. So we'll see a lot about generics in this session and let's uh, get into the session 18. A sorted list uh, by the word itself uh, says that um, it has uh, a sorting mechanism implemented built in within um, the class itself. And the so this is again a key value pair, uh, just like a uh, uh, just like your hash table, where you have the key value pair implementation. Whereas hash table is a little uh, huge uh, in terms of uh, uh, the way it handles inside. It has it it handles the items inside a hash table as a key value pair. At the same time, the it, uh, it relies mostly on the hash code that is uh, driven out from the key. Uh, so the key can be of any objects so you can have your own custom uh, class implemented with overriding a hash code and ensure that the hash code is unique. So inside the hash table mechanism itself it maintains uh, buckets of uh, the hash code range and that's how the lookup mechanism is much faster when you do with the hash table implementation. And also, as a keyword table suggests, it, it really behaves like a table, ensuring a couple of uh, constraints on the data that you add into a hash table, like uh, not null constraints, so you cannot have uh, keys with the null values in a hash table, and so on. So we did talk uh, more in detail about a hash table behavior. And the sorted list, on the other hand, is um, uh, okay, in hash table also does the sorting, but the sorting by default uh, is on the uh, on the hash code, not on the uh, on the key values that is given. When you come to the sorted list, um, again, so it uh, pretty much maintains the sorted key value pairs. Again, the sorting is done on the key, and this has nothing to do with the hash or hash code of the value that you pass in. And of course, this takes um, objects as a key. Okay, and, uh, and the important uh, advantage of sorted list is you can uh, access uh, the sorted list uh, either by key or in this case, as I said, you can access it either by using key or by index. So we did, uh, we did talk about uh, the advantages of accessing a value using a key and then using an index when we talked about the for each and also the uh, for statements, right? So using a for, you can actually uh, access an array's uh, uh, item using the index, uh, wherein you can actually update the values as well. So when you come to for each, um, you cannot update the values within it. So for each again, um, so it need to implement the I enumerable, right? Interface. So um, the sorted list implements the I enumerable, which enables the list to be um, uh, iterated through using the for each statement. And also at the same time, it has a couple of methods uh, which makes the sorted list uh, to read using its index also. Okay, that's one thing we'll see in, uh, in the code example at the same time. And another thing uh, uh, with uh, uh, another important thing with the sorted list is the, the capacity of the sorted list by default 
um, once you add a one, item 1, it's going to be defaulted to 16 numbers. So it's going to reserve a uh, space for 16 uh, items at a time. So when the uh, when the when if you add the 17th element to the list, uh, it's going to add another 16 uh, reserved elements uh, to it. If you remember, uh, when we do the manual arrays uh, handling the uh, add remove uh, mechanism, so we need to actually uh, resize the, uh, the 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 private data members uh, in order to hold the required number of um, uh, items that are adding up, so which are handled by default uh, by all these built-in classes, uh, we, uh, which was the first one of the advantages we did talk about uh, when we talked about the built-in um, collections. So in this case, uh, uh, the sorted list, uh, it comes with the I dictionary. So if you see the, uh, the core thing, so it implements the I dictionary interface, which makes it as a key value pair, right? So if it is I list, uh, uh, which is going to be completely different, it's going to be uh, only a value, not the key and value pair, uh, which we saw in array list. So array list doesn't have a key value pair, it just handles only the values, uh, whereas it implements the I list interface. So sorted list in implements the I dictionary, I collection, which makes it as a collection, and uh, I enumerable, which enables the sorted list to be uh, I iterated using the for each statement and I clonable uh, which can make a shallow, co shallow copies of the list. Okay, so if we have seen that the capacity, again we didn't, probably we didn't cover or not, I'm not pretty sure, but for array list the default is 8. Uh, if I, um, yeah, we can actually uh, see that in a demo, uh, we'll compare with the, the default uh, um, the capacity that is allocated uh, for array list is 8 and for subsequent multiples of 8 whereas for sorted list it is 16 and multiples of 16. Okay, So that comes the array list and by, by dictionary implementation it has all these um, um, method, properties and methods available in the I dictionary interface and the sorted list comes out of shell for implementing all these um, members. So you don't have to really do anything unless you really want to do some customizations. And on top of this, if you remember, um, what is a this? So this is a special uh, property. So this is an indexer, which is a special property. It's a kind of a property, but not exactly property. It takes a parameter of uh, type int. Or it can be int or any data type, uh, but it takes an index in general. So you can make your classes uh, uh, behave like a collections uh, by implementing the indexers and in C-sharp it is um, covered using the this keyword uh, whereas in VB.NET it is item right so just want to recap on those as well and the next uh, interface it, it comes uh, with implementation is I collection wherein it has the count, uh, copy to, get enumerator, of course get enumerator because I collection itself implements I enumerable right? in general and its special um, properties like e-synchronized and sync root are the two special cases which we did discuss in the past uh, uh, which are used for uh, thread safety implementation on the classes on the collection. So, okay. And I enumerable, uh, again, we just discussed, it has only one method called uh, get enumerator, uh, which is, uh, which need to be implemented for uh, your collection to be um, iterated using the for each statement. And finally, the I clonable interface has only one, mem one method, uh, which is clone. So uh, sorted list comes with implementation for clone. So you can straight away uh, clone the a sorted list and create multiple copies of the uh, sorted list. Okay, so we uh, get into the other aspects. Uh, now sorted list, we as we uh, as a keyword itself uh, says that it stores the values in the sorted order. Okay, so the sorting is a fundamental uh, operation of a sorted list. So once you keep on adding items to the sorted list, uh, it's going to sort them uh, immediately. So there comes the um, 
the uh, the importance of the comparer uh, interface so here. So uh, why comparer? Because uh, once you add a uh, item one, like say hundred and two hundred, uh, hundred and some name and two hundred and some name. In order to sort it, uh, it needs to know uh, how it how it needs to be sorted. Um, if it is a number, uh, if it is just an integer, you know uh, it's plain straightforward algorithm. So if it's all greater than less than uh, uh, thing that you can apply on, and if it is a string, again it's a straightforward algorithm wherein you sort the strings using a sorting algorithm. So since the key is a object, so uh, if you see the key value pair, since the key is a not a number or a not a string, it can, it is an object, so you can actually put your own custom class as part of the key. So that's when the comparer becomes very important, when you deal with the custom um, classes uh, as a key. So here in this first case, uh, we're, uh, we, we're just not uh, uh, notifying the uh, sorted list with any specific comparer. So it's going to implicitly apply the uh, built-in compa uh, comparer uh, to com to sort the items that you're adding up. So the uh, we're in this first case, we are actually making use of the default constructor. So we're not passing any arguments to it and not notifying with any comparer. So the in internally, it's going to do the default uh, sorting. So in this case, uh, I have a number uh, passed as the first key uh, and the uh, some string as a second argument, which is, so in this case I have a key of type number and a value of type string. So remember the sorting is always applied on the key, not on the value. So that's a key thing you need to know. know. And it is just as uh, same as the way you use any of the collections, simply add them and uh, retrieve them and search them or sort them based on your algorithm. So, um, so same mechanism, but the way uh, uh, the sorted list is designed to work uh, makes, uh, makes it uh, ideal for a couple of uh, scenarios. So we need to uh, understand the scenarios based on their capabilities that they come with. Okay, so how you read the uh, values from the uh, sorted list, it's using the for each here. So if you remember, uh, with it uh, as part of a theory, it says we can use it, uh, you can read it using either for each or by using the index, right? So we're going to see both. So in this case, when you do a for each, it's mandatory that you uh, look up for the uh, items of type dictionary entry. So we did see the dictionary entry is a structure which has a bit, uh, two properties, which is key and value. So when you add a four, a number four and uh, text four, uh, internally it's going to maintain all these uh, items in, in terms of a dictionary entries, uh, dictionary entry type. So that's how when you read them out, uh, we need to type cast those values or look up for the values of typed uh, dictionary entries. And then we will have the key and value properties available, Make you, making use of that, you can read the values out. So this is uh, by using the for each statement. And at the same time, you can also read it using the indexer. So that is the indexer that's using by for loop. So remember the difference between the for each and for is that uh, using for each, you can only read the content, but you cannot update the content because for to update the content, you need to actually uh, read it using the uh, the uh, the indexer uh, and specify the exact location where it is and then update it. And uh, also for using for uh, uh, using for, you can actually go straight away update it. So in this case, uh, we I create to the we create the indexer as start from zero and uh, now uh, increment the value from uh, 0 to count minus 1 because 0 is index and uh, you need to always do minus 1 otherwise it's going to uh, uh, error out because it's, uh, it's going to reach, try to reach the last element which is not going to be there. For example, if the uh, uh, number of items in the sorted list are uh, 5 and uh, if you try to reach 0 to 5 
um, because fifth element won't be there uh, because it's going to only index from 0 to 4 makes it five elements in it. Okay, so uh, it need to be always minus 1. And I++ plus plus we're incrementing and similarly we're making use of the uh, get key here passing the indexer it's going to give you the key out and also get by index will give you the value using the index. Probably this would have named uh, get value by index or get value simply. Um, this is a little misleading uh, I would say. Uh, this is very straightforward. Get key is really straightforward. Uh, the name itself, but here the name is not that user friendly. But you know uh, that's what it is. I'm not sure why. Um, so get by index will give you the value out of it. Okay. So let's say the output of this. In this case, if you see the capacity is 16. So that's what uh, important to note by default. And although it has five elements within it, uh, the count is five. Uh, the capacity is actually 16 because it's uh, internally allocated uh, 16 elements to it. Okay, so the VB.NET um, um, code looks quite similar um, um, and uh, we just only the syntax is going to be different otherwise the whole thing is going to be same. Uh, the way you declare variables in VB.NET is using dim and sorted list and add the values to it and then read it using the dictionary type and the same for each statement. I didn't put the uh, code for uh, using the indexer because there is no space here otherwise it is doable similar way the way we have in C sharp.net. Okay, so we'll quicker quickly go ahead and uh, uh, run this code snippet with the default const, uh, con, uh, comparer. Okay. As usual in C sharp, um, so we're going to comment out uh, any active code and then okay this is with the default code the names are self-explanatory you can actually look up and uh, see this sorted list with the default comparer. Okay. I'm going to select this all and uncomment the whole thing. So we're going to walk through the same uh, code snippet here. Um, here, I just had a couple of additional uh, items here to demonstrate the, the behavior of the capacity. So we'll see the base behavior uh, with having the five elements, uh, five items within the sorted list. And uh, displaying them out, uh, its properties and values before and after. Okay, so the key thing here is uh, I have a print values overloaded here. So in this case, I have print values, which is taking I enumerable interface. Uh, remember, we have been using the same signature for all the collections because all the collections implement I enumerable. And using this, we can di directly use the for each statement. So um, this makes a very generic uh, method except that a couple of uh, collections don't have a dictionary entry and a couple of do. So that's where the change is. Otherwise, the signature remains same so far. Uh, for um, sorted list to make the use of the uh, reading using the indexer, we have changed the signature to accept the sorted list. Why? The reason is so not that. Uh, I, I enumerable uh, in this case uh, doesn't have the methods of uh, properties in uh, properties uh, uh, that are available with the sorted list. The two pro two methods, in other words, are not properties, but the two methods that are used to okay uh, that are used to retrieve using index is the get key and uh, get by index. So those are available only for the sorted list and that's the reason it needs to be a sorted list. And if it's I enumerable, it really doesn't help me to make the call. So if, they, if you pass something else, uh, like array list in this case, array list also satisfies the signature because it also implements the I enumerable. But when you come in the code and try to read the get key, it's going to fail because error list doesn't have the get key or get by index. So that's the reason I have two versions of the print values uh, wherein uh, in the first case uh, we have the default dictionary uh, entry and the other one is the sorted list as direct. 
So we see at runtime which one is going to be picked. Okay. So in this case, uh, as part of the print list, I'm just passing the my sorted list, which is of type uh, sorted list. Okay. So I have two overloaded members here, one with the I enumerable, another one with the sorted list. So the question goes, uh, which one will be called first? Because the question is a logical question because the uh, sorted list also implements I enumerable, right? If you if you see my uh, this slide before, Oops, going to back, okay. So uh, sorted list also implements I enumerable, okay. So that's the key there, uh, and so the question comes: which print values uh, version will be preferred? Okay, let's try it out and see, and then come with the explanation. So I'm going for that to check. I'm adding a breakpoint at both the uh, both the methods, and both are public static, and, um, and both are print values, and only the signature difference. This is an overloaded member. And in this case, I'm passing the sorted list, right? So when I skip, uh, start this off, so if you see it, uh, the the print values of uh, passing the sorted list data type is visited. Uh, it really ignored the i enumerable. Okay. So the thumb of rule goes behind this uh, uh, theory is that the immediate uh, a uh, close match of the, the parameter or the argument that is passed is uh, taken into consideration while picking up the correct uh, version. So since the uh, the parameter that is passed in is a data type of uh, sorted list, if the sorted list version is picked versus the i enumerable. Okay, so we to reverse it, so I'm going to just take this off. Okay. There is no sorted list version, so will this be visited? Yes, it does visit it because this is the nearest match for the uh, parameter that is passed in. So it's going to pick this version to use. So that's the key thing that you need to remember in mind uh, when you're dealing with the uh, related classes having uh, overloaded members. So which overloaded member is going to be visited is a uh, is a point that need to be remembered. Otherwise, uh, uh, you might uh, expect something from your implementation and something else is coming out and you might have a half a dozen of overloaded members uh, with variable signatures or variable data types. Um, so that need to be a critical thing that you might remember. So this could result to a logical errors uh, that you might uh, even uh, can't predict. So uh, the reason being, uh, you expect that uh, you, the print values need to be implemented, uh, visited, but at, at runtime it is somehow picking this and the implementation of uh, the print values with I enumerable is different from the uh, print values with sorted list and the, the behavior that you see outside might be uh, reflecting the uh, the earlier one. So in that case you might uh, have a logical error. So you, uh, always remember whenever you're doing overloaded members with the parameters uh, uh, which are part of the same inheritance hierarchy and passing the member of the um, the, uh, the class that is falling under in given inheritance hierarchy. So the closest match uh, of that object type is always taken into consideration. Okay. So that's uh, the reason I just added that as well here. And so in this case, uh, the default is the sorted list. So it's going to, we're going to make use of the get uh, key and get by index to read the values. Okay. So, so um, we already passed it. we we'll come to the next line while debugging. Okay. So these are the values uh, that we are looking at here. And I can copy this and put it in the immediate window with the question mark here, which is two. We are the second element. And also we're going to make use of the oops, get uh, by index. So this is going to take i which is 2. 
Okay, so if I say three, it's going to be four because the third element has the value four. So it uh, so it's going to give you the value, whereas the get gives get key gives you the key. So this is the output of the collection. So if you see the values at the initialization uh, here, we have added one, three, five, two, four, which is not in a sorted order. Whereas when it came out, it's in a sorted order. So that's the uh, default sorter applied on the key that you have added up. Okay, and the, the capacity is 16, right? So that's another thing that we wanted to see here. So what if I am going to add any additional items? In this case, up to 16, right? So this is the 16th element that we have. We let's see the capacity if there is any change. Let me take off the breakpoint here and run again. Okay, so the capacity, if you see, the count is 16 and the capacity is 16. So it really did not change. So the next element when I add up, uh, so it's going to uh, to take up the next 16 uh, elements, right? So it's going to add up uh, the next size. So that's where it is. So it's actually added uh, 16 more and make this as 32. Okay, all of the count is 17. So the sorted list uh, implicitly adds uh, 16 items at a time. Okay, that's the um, uh, default behavior, how the sorted um, list is going to handle. Okay, and uh, again, yes, and uh, with respect to this, which is fine, and with respect to the error list, we'll see the behavior. I hope we have uh, seen that. I'm not sure whether we did focus on that or not. Uh, that's the reason I'm just going back. Uh, so in this case, uh, for the array list, so if you see, uh, yeah, here I have a 16 because I have a, uh, 10 elements here. So what if I reduce the four of them? Okay, so I'm going, just going to reduce, uh, remove the four of them. So this will make having a list of one, two, three, four, five, six item, six elements, right? So if you see the uh, capacity here, so array list plays with eight items at a time, whereas order list uh, have sixteen at a time. And uh, if I increase the number of items here. In this case, I have added the four more, making them 10. So I have a total number of items, uh, items are 10, but the capacity is 16. So uh, that's the key difference again, versus um, uh, error list. Of course, uh, error list handles only uh, a value, not a key value pair. That's another major difference. Okay, so we did see the default comparer behavior, right? So it's uh, plain vanilla. Uh, it applies the uh, internal logic of a default comparer, and uh, which is good. Okay, <clears throat> let me resume. Yep. Okay, now with the uh, custom comparer. So you, as I said. If you, have, if you have your own class, uh, yeah, another thing that uh, probably I didn't uh, pay attention here uh, is the signature. This is a, for today's session, it's going to be very, very important uh, to note uh, the signature, whatever uh, data type it's taking. If you see, it takes the object key and object value. And if you remember, object is uh, the root of all the uh, this is a, it's a root class for all the classes in .NET. So that means uh, it takes an object, that means it can take any data type. It can be a value type or a reference type, doesn't matter. Uh, in this case, it's a clear example, wherein I pass the integer uh, one in 32 type, and also I pass a string. So, uh, so object means I can pass even my custom data type as well, because if I have a custom class, like in this second example, we're going to see, uh, so how it's going to be beneficial and uh, what are the things that you need to consider when you do a custom 
comparer. So this is the second example that I have, um, so which we're going to see today. So in this uh, second example, the important thing that we see here is the I'm passing a custom comparer as a notifying the sorted list to use the comparer that I have written my own, which is my person comparer. Because in this case, I have decided to use my person class as a key. So if you see, as as in terms of uh, in place of key, I'm passing the instance of person class. And of course, if, since it has a parameterized constructor, uh, I'm passing the values for the person as part of the uh, initialization itself or instantiation itself. And also the second parameter, I'm passing uh, the in place of value, I'm passing just a plain string, although it can be any object, right? So if, you, uh, if you're dealing with uh, um, a custom um, class in, in the real-time implementations, right? So if you, for example, uh, if you take a relationship like uh, a product versus orders relationship, if you say that, um, so the order has a products, number of products with the names, and if you have a collection that handles products uh, classes, uh, that's a, uh, that's a real-time implication where you might end up adding a custom class to a collection. And in this example, so when I have my custom class as my key, so in this case, uh, the comparer, uh, the default comparer will not work anymore because the default comparer will never know uh, how to use your uh, custom class because your custom class can have some number of properties that you may rely on. Uh, in this case, the properties of a person is the ID and the name. Um, so the ID it could be my uh, key for sorting. So how does the default com uh, comparer know? There's no way. So that's the reason you have to have your own comparer and write your own implementation uh, saying how you want to compare or how you want to uh, compare, uh, let this sorted list compare the elements within it and to, to sort them in, in an order. Okay, so we'll see uh, how these sort uh, the comparer implementation goes. So this is uh, the person class, which is having a two. Uh, defo uh, the default constructor itself, itself is taking two arguments, which is ID and name. Okay, and of course it has a property called ID and name, so which you can access directly. And the person comparer. So the comparer implementation uh, relies on the person definition. Right, so in this case, the I comparer is the interface that it's need to be implemented. So that's the first line. It goes the custom comparer class must implement I comparer interface. So that's how the sort uh, when you add uh, an items to it, uh, what it's going to blindly call is the compare method, and compare uh, method is available as part of the I comparer interface. So when I say a person comparer, it must uh, implement the I comparer interface uh, in order to pass that as an argument. So that's the first thing. So it, uh, similarly, we have seen a, a very good example with I enumerable, wherein get enumerator is the method that you need to implement uh, as part of the uh, I enumerable. And the similarly here, we need to implement the I comparer here. And the I comparer has a only one method called compare and it has uh, two objects. So this is only one uh, overall member, there's no others. So it's going to take two objects, sorry. It's going to take two objects here, object X and Y. It's plain simple. So whenever uh, the comparer comes, it's always going to pass two objects to it uh, and you just have to write your own logic how you want to compare it both and provide a couple of uh, uh, integer values. So if you see, int is the output. So in in plain way, uh, in a simple example, so what is the value that you need to written out in order to say that okay, object x should be topper or object y should be bottom. So in the sorting order, right? So which one comes first or which one comes next? So all you need to do is that. Uh, or, or so if, the, if the int is zero, that means both are same. 
in in general right in practice if int is zero that means both are same in this case for example uh, the simple logic we have right uh, p1 uh, id minus i2 i just said id uh, p1 id minus i2 if I take an example wherein uh, you're trying to compare uh, 100 versus 100 so if you see minus of these two will be zero when it says zero that means both are same so they need not be you know they either way it's fine one on top of the other is fine if at all you want to really make sure um, uh, you also if both are same and you also want to sort on the value part of it which is uh, uh, sorry uh, the name part of it like p1 dot name then again you can add the same logic here uh, bottom line at the end when you return a integer out you need to specify three things either it is a zero that means both are same or if it is plus uh, a positive number that means uh, one is greater than other one and a negative number that means uh, if whenever it is negative then the x will be top of uh, uh, y or vice versa okay um, so in this case uh, it's a sim very simple logic I put wherein I'm just trying to get the uh, math of uh, uh, p1.id and p2.id if uh, p1.id is greater than p2.id I'll get some positive um, positive number uh, or negative number vice versa or zero okay if you uh, want to expand this logic uh, okay then it can be it can go like this okay it's the same thing as this instead of writing uh, such a long statement uh, I just made it a little easy way Okay, so this logic also does the same thing. So wherein now we are comparing p1.id is greater than p2.id, wherein we are, uh, if it is greater than written one, uh, if it is less, then if it is, um, it's uh, minus one or zero. So instead of uh, such if and else, I made it simple logic. So when you imp implement the compare, that's what you need to keep in mind that you return an integer indicating uh, which order you want to sort. And since uh, this block is within you, so you can actually put any logic, any business logic here. And also, if you see this uh, data type is object, uh, both are objects. Uh, that indicates that I comparer can be implemented on any type of uh, a data type. Okay. If you have uh, in this, uh, this is a typical example wherein I have my own class uh, here, which is person simply completely my own class wherein I have my ID name person and I'm adding a person to um, the sorted list as a key and I'm, I'm really not caring about the value here and that's why I just put some text here and uh, yes how do you read them out so you read them out using the same thing so uh, in this case uh, okay so another important thing probably I did not focus here is the person right since I have the object X and object Y, so I'm passing the I comparer to my sorted list and I'm adding the um, persons instances to the list. So you can actually pass anything here as a matter of fact, right? If I pass person here and, and another an item called integer here and I do the same comparer on that, it's going to break. Because uh, for every item that you're adding, it's going to look call for this compare and it's when you compare is called it's straightforward uh, trying to cast it to person and if I pass integer value here this cast is going to break so it, you need to ensure that you always pass only the person uh, data type here so that's again a usage wise whoever is using this uh, sorted list they have to uh, ensure that they pass only those values whereas uh, the next topic that we're going to talk uh, uh, which is generics as generics will answer these kind of issues um, and we'll see um, soon after completing this topic so in this case um, so we have a person class and I need to pass only the, the person instances into my key and because I'm making use of the person comparer the person comparer is actually built to handle persons because I'm typecasting and uh, assuming that you're passing only person and you, it's a mandatory that you need to be passing only instance of person nothing else and in this case when I, while reading it out it also ensures that uh, or it's kind of a hard coding that I'm looking for person 
that you're passing in and uh, there should be a person if the key is, is not a person then it's this casting is going to fail so we're not doing any uh, 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 robust code here to check that I'm passing a person or not so you can otherwise you can do that so you can always check the comp uh, the uh, uh, the casting is working or is of type uh, person and then continue with the logic so uh, this sample is really not handling that scenario um, to keep it simple okay and in this case I'm looking for a person and type casting the key to person and I'm reading the values out using the key dot ID and name so remember ID and name are the properties available with my person class itself which is ID and name. Since I'm type casting the key to person I can make use of ID and name here. Okay, makes sense and uh, hope you this code snippet is clear and the output here if you see we're going to run this of course uh, since I passed 200, 500, 300, 100 so we have uh, the values in sorted order. Okay, and again the capacity is 16. So we'll see this in action. Okay, so in this case, uh, yeah, it's the same thing. The comparer implementation uh, has compare and we had object X and object Y. We are typecasting P1 and P2 to person and person uh, by P1 and P2. And this is the uh, logic. You can write if and else or simply this, okay? And the returning this values out. Okay, so uh, and uh, then we have the person class here with ID and name and also it has a default constructor, uh, parameter as constructor, not the default constructor, sorry. And also the print method to print, but I'm not actually making use of the print statement at this point here. Okay, and the main class we have the created instance of the my sorted list and passing the comparer here and uh, also I'm passing the instance of persons here. Okay, so we see the happy path and uh, the key thing to uh, note here is uh, the order in which the IDs are, okay, all in my person. Okay, so if you see the uh, the order is changed, okay, so it's, it's in sorted order and uh, the sorting is done based on the algorithm that I have. How do I know? We can go and debug and see. Okay, so print values, so we'll ignore this for now. So we wanted to see how this has been called and is it really making use of my comparer or not, right? So to check that first step is remove the comparer, okay? So this statement is okay. If I remove this and use a default, um, uh, default constructor, what will happen? Okay. So it's compile time, there's no problem, it's fine. And I'm passing these values and let's see. So it's got errored out, right? So it says fail to compare two elements in the array. So that's an error, you see it failed to compare because the, it passed the first element. Uh, at the second element, it failed saying fail to compare two elements. Why? Because um, your custom class uh, is beyond the default comparer's capabilities to compare and sort them. Okay, that is the proof number one that it's using the person comparer. Okay, and in the second case, we have passed the person comparer, and of course it ran well. We saw that, and we, let's go to the definition of this. Okay, and add a breakpoint here. Okay, if you see the Typical behavior here, right? Oh, let's do it first. Had a breakpoint there and run this. Of course, the breakpoint came and it's trying to compare both the elements. It ensures that it is making use of my sorting logic. Okay, type cast is successful. I have a P1 with 100 and 200 and uh, P2 with 500 and 500, of course. And uh, it's making use of my uh, straight logic. And uh, okay, let me add a breakpoint here to make it simple, right? Let's take it away from here. 
So the uh, the result is a negative value, right? So it's going to keep the 500 down and the um, other one up. And again, negative value, the x will be down and y will be up and so on, vice versa. And now we have a positive value. So it's going to sort based on my return value. So it is calling that for every element that I'm adding up and comparing with the, uh, the last element that is posted inside the error list. Okay, so this is uh, really, uh, if you think too uh, deep, uh, the main breakpoint is really not that intuitive, right? So it's really not that helpful to tell me uh, either it is calling, for example, if I'm adding a 300 at a given time and the list is already having uh, two elements like 500 or 200, so is it comparing 300 with uh, all the available list or just comparing with the last uh, in the list? So uh, that's kind of a question you want to really know, right? Because uh, uh, if it is really comparing, uh, say for example, you, you already have 100 items within the list and you add the 101th item. So is it going to compare uh, the 101th item with all the 100 elements and see that where it's going to fall? Is it going to fall at the middle of it or the end of it or the beginning of it? So, or is does it have any shortcut algorithm that it's trying to do? If it is really doing a comparison with all the 100 elements and uh, determine whether it's going to fall uh, middle and at the top, uh, then that's going to be very expensive. Um, to handle, right? Because it's not going to be very useful. Um, it's going to slow down your uh, collection operation when it, when your items in the collection grow to a large number. Okay, so to in order to answer such kind of questions, it's really d difficult for you to really debug and see how it is doing. So, so we'll see the new thing that we have here is the debug statements. So in these kind of situations. Um, uh, these statements really will be handy. Okay, so what I'm going to do is the, let's see the first case. So by the way, what is the debug? So debug is a again a built-in uh, class which provides the debug information, uh, which is available in the system dot diagnostics namespace. Okay, so if you see the diagnostic namespace, it has a couple of other things, right? So this it has so many other things wherein you can use to uh, diagnose your code at runtime. And if you see the code analysis, contracts, uh, eventing, uh, performance data, so if you want to have a performance counters on your code, you can implement this as a performance data and a symbol store. Use the debug symbols that you're going to, uh, you can make use of it. And the code analysis um, uh, has a, um, members that will help you to analyze the runtime efficiency of your code and uh, so on. So. We are not going to go in, jump into the too many details of the diagnostics itself. Um, system of diagnostics itself is a, a big one, and of course, it is a very useful one uh, in terms of uh, instrumentation of your code uh, and see what's happening behind the code. A, a typical case like this, right? Uh, in this case, I'm going to have make use of a very fundamental statement called a debug dot print. What this is going to do is uh, provide me the debug information of the code. Okay, so how different is debug.print from console.writeline? So I can also get the same information. If you see this, uh, the, uh, this main text, how it goes, I have a placeholder and I'm passing the values, right? So it is uh, similarly, uh, I can do it using my console.writeline and also get this information out, right? Um, so it debug.print is pr pretty much different from console.writeline. Console.writeline, you can make use of it when you want to show the output to the end user on the screen. So it's going to pretty much comes out of the screen uh, on your console output uh, for user to see. Whereas debug.print is not for the user, it's for the uh, for the developer who works, uh, who is want to debug the code and see the information out. Another plus point with debug.print is you can actually uh, write this code and leave it in the production code. There's no harm. Uh, and it's not going to really give you any performance, all performance issues also. Uh, you can actually leave this code in the production code, which is perfectly fine. And that gives you an, uh, an added advantage of uh, 
having the debug information uh, written out to a flat file. Um, so to in order to write to a flat file, you need to actually do some kind of a configuration in your app.config and other things. I hope you remember uh, uh, we did talk about the fundamentals of the project. So we're in the configuration file for Windows-based configuration is app.config and for web-based applications are web.config. So we have to configure the debug uh, dot, uh, uh, diagnostics um, uh, section and specify the tracers uh, and enable them. Uh, it's kind of a different configuration which I don't want to go at this stage. Uh, at this stage I just wanted to show you uh, the benefit of debug.print uh, while debugging uh, scenarios like this. So you want to see that, okay, is it comparing each and every element with the existing uh, uh, array of elements or not, right? So with this, uh, how it's going to help. Okay, so I'm going to run the code. So it, it ran the way it, it is running. So where is this debug.print going out? So where is it writing? Is it writing to immediate.window? No. Is it in locals? No. So where is it going? So it's going to the output window. So if you see the, there is a view output. If you see the view output pan, uh, of course you need to scroll up to see it. Okay, so this is what, uh, if you see the debug, uh, this output pan, it normally gives you all the debug information when it's uh, building the project and running the project. A lot of information is provided within the output window, including if you see the uh, the thread uh, or the thread number or what's happening when it's trying to run it. So by default, every program will have one thread, if you remember. Um, so this is a thread that is initiated and so on. So it's has a lot of information that goes within uh, the execution. So as part of the debug.print when you do, see it's going to write that output to the output window. So how, what are the values we see here? So I see 200 and 200 and 300. Um, uh, so this is ID 1. So in the first case, it actually have compared with uh, uh, 200 versus 500. And the second case, 200 versus 300. So that means uh, when is this happening? So I can come here and analyze how the values are getting passed. In the first case, I passed 200. Uh, in that case, there is no previous um, or pre previous uh, item in the list, right? This is the first item in the list. In that case, it didn't call. When I passed 500, uh, it did compare with 200. So the first element is 200 and the second element is 500, right? And again, uh, that's, that's the end of it. And this, when it came to third element, which is 300, so 300 got compared with two of those elements, right? Um, it's 200 and as well as 500. That means in this case, it actually compared with all the elements in the list. And let's come to the third element, which is 100. Did it compare with all the existing three elements? No. It did compare only with the two elements because it already knows the difference, uh, which one comes, uh, uh, which one is more than the other one, uh, and smartly uh, analyze that information and call the compare uh, only the number of times where it needs to be compared to. In this case, the 500 is the maximum uh, value that's already been sorted out and put at the bottom most, and the 100 is falling somewhere. Uh, less than that, so it actually called only for twice, which is uh, 300 and 200. It didn't call for the 500 element because 500 is already determined to be the max number in the list. So it does a kind of a smart algorithm inside it, so it, it is not going to be always uh, the number of elements uh, compared with the given, given uh, element, right? So it's going to kind of a permutation combination if you see. So that's uh, the overview of uh, the debug option uh, that you can make use of it uh, for debugging purpose. And if you see, uh, I'm not really debugging here. I have the debug information out and I can analyze it uh, clearly. So that's the advantage of debug.print. Okay, and at the same time, oops, I need to end the execution to change the code.
okay so this another useful uh, but not that often used by anyone and the debug opportunity is a very very useful one it is it was often used in most of the cases like complex uh, iterations that you want to really handle or debug the iterations uh, that you want to do normally so in that case it's useful debug.assert is another one so wherein um, if you want to uh, analyze the the execution of the code um, uh, at a given point of time okay the conditionally you want to check there uh, for this kind of scenario you already have a uh, breakpoints right if you remember the, you can add a conditional breakpoints as well if you remember um, Okay, so yeah, here I go. So once you add a breakpoint and add a condition to it, so this way also you can do it directly, wherein I can just put my condition here saying uh, p1.id is, is equal to p2.id. And when that condition uh, is reached, I can uh, do a breakpoint here and debug from line by line. Okay, and uh, or also if you see, you can actually attach to a variable and see uh, has changed. If the variable value has changed, at that point also the breakpoint will work. So breakpoints also you can make use of it to have a conditional debugging, and at the same time, uh, when you want to when we, when you want to use uh, debug.assert, so debug.assert you can use uh, when you want to see the call stack at the given point of time. Um, that will give you the information. Uh, call stack. If you see what is call stack, okay, let us see what is call stack. So in this case, uh, I don't have a breakpoint here, and I said uh, debug.assert when. ID uh, p one dot id is equal to p two dot id. So when this situation arises, um, so what will happen? What happens here is it's going to give me the call stack information. So this is the call stack. That means the, how the calls have been uh, made to reach to that point. So this information will be helpful to see uh, what is the previous method it got uh, invoked and what is the next method that got invoked and uh, uh, see the uh, the tree of the calls that have been made. So that's called as a call stack. And at this point, I can may analyze this information for again a troubleshooting. So maybe may not be you, this may be used very often, um, but there is an option that you need to be aware of and what it does is this okay you can actually go ahead and uh, check this values so if it is 200 and 300 if it is uh, uh, when this is false that's the thing if it is if this assert statement result to a false then it's going to uh, break otherwise no in this case it is false 200 and 300 it is not matching so it is false so that's why the assert was giving you the debug information Okay, again, the, uh, this can go with your uh, compiled code. It's not going to pop up uh, and make it. Usually, uh, assert is not that oftenly used. Okay, so uh, that's what I wanted to show you uh, with the custom comparer uh, and also some of the debug tips that you can make use of it. And I strongly recommend you practice these options uh, and familiarize yourself with the ID um, so that uh, you can uh, make use of these features without searching for them. Okay. And that brings the, the topic to an end. And the next topic is the name value collection. And uh, this is part of the uh, system dot collections dot uh, specialized namespace. So there are a couple of more uh, within this specialized namespace and these are really special classes which can be used um, for a very variety of re uh, reasons uh, and definitely it's not possible for me to walk you through the all the available members in this namespace. Uh, so I'm going to give you uh, cover the the most important one is the name value collection uh, this is going to be very useful when you're doing a web-based applications, and uh, and this is pretty much a same like a collection. If you see, it has uh, all the known interfaces that we have seen so far, and uh, yes, so the name value collection uh, name value collection is a class. Again, it's a class. It's not an abstract class. It has a concrete class, uh, which is actually uh, inheriting from name object collection base. This is another class, which is an abstract class. That's a key thing to note. So, of course, if you see the abstract classes, 
uh, cannot be instantiated directly and made use of them, make use of them. Uh, you need to have some class to inherit and implement it uh, to make use of the abstract functionalities. The reason being, so abstract uh, as the name itself says that it has some of the abstract members uh, which doesn't have the body within it. So whichever uh, class uh, inherit them, they need to provide the definition for those abstract members. In addition, the abstract members will have some of the concrete members also. Okay, so the abstract class, the name object collection base is an abstract class and your name value collection is actually uh, inheriting from the name object collection base and also implementing the necessary members. And what are there? We have I collection, in this case name value collection is actually inheriting the name object collection base which is an abstract class and the name object collection base is implementing I collection which we saw and also I enumerable which we have seen and I serializable which we have seen when we uh, talk about the uh, hash tables. Try the hash table at that point of time uh, I did cover in detail uh, about the serialization and deserialization aspects um, and also covering the I serializable and um, Another one is I deserialization callback. So we did cover these two. So uh, the the benefit of having a name value collection is that it implements the serialization as well. So this is a big plus um, for the name uh, value collection. So when it has uh, the I, serializa I serializable things, so hash table. Remember hash table does that, and also name value collection does that. And hash table usage wise it is pretty uh, a completely different way it has the same it has the sorting algorithm implemented within it uh, which relies on the hash code of the keys which is pretty much uh, usage wise you can use the hash table as a data table and uh, at the same time uh, the hash table since it implements the I serializable interface and uh, also deserialization um, callback interfaces, uh, they are the good candidates for uh, serialization. Uh, again, so recap on what is serialization. The so serialization is the process in which you can uh, persist or convert the uh, in-memory objects to a, a persistent storage, where it can be in a database or it can be a flat file. It can be a like, flat file in terms of uh, XML file or a CSV file or or it can be a stream of um, byte array that you can transfer from one call to another call in kind of in case of a remote method invocation or uh, RMI invocation or remote remoting concepts in other words it can be a server to server remoting or a network to network uh, remoting as well so wherein uh, the services comes into play so in all those wide variety of scenarios you can make use of the hash table and as well in this case name value collection and uh, yes so when will you choose uh, hash tape uh, sorry uh, hash table versus uh, name value collection it's pretty simple uh, whenever you really ha have a need of having a table like behavior uh, where you need to have some kind of uh, constraint enforced on the keys um, uh, I should behave like a table like it must have a not null unique values within a key and value uh, and values can of course can be anything um, so in those cases and you have a large a large number of values that you want to play with and the hash tables are the ideal place um, ideal ones that you can handle uh, and also it can be serialized it implements the I serializable so it, it makes the ideal candidate for you to use for uh, serial, serialization um, um, implementations uh, especially in services for, in, in, to be to be specific uh, you can make use of them in service calls and other things. And also, um, when you come to name value collection, they are very lightweight. Um, so name value collections are very, very lightweight. Uh, it doesn't have kind of uh, sorting behavior within them. Uh, we'll see all those characteristics in the next slide. And uh, so, so based on those characteristics, uh, you need to judge which one fits best in the given scenario. Okay. 
Uh, yes, so these are some other characteristics of a name value collection. The first one uh, says um, the name value collection represents a collection of associated string keys and string values. So this is only strings. So all the keys can be only strings and the values also can be string. Whereas in hash table it can be of any type, right? Because it takes key as an object and value as an object. Okay, so uh, as I said, so name value collection is a very lightweight. Uh, and that can be uh, accessed either by the key or index, just like uh, our previous sorted list. It can be accessed again using the key or index. And this class can be used for headers, queries, strings, and form data. So these are the wide variety of usages. Uh, since it is very lightweight and also has the serialization implemented, uh, it can be used as a header. This is, these are all specific to the uh, web-based applications. Okay? Hope uh, these terms may be new to you. Uh, we, we, you may you'll be more familiar when uh, we talk about the ASP.NET applications, wherein the uh, you have a HTTP headers. You can make use of the uh, name value collection as a HTTP headers or the query strings and the form data and so on. So it has a wide variety of use. So since uh, you transfer data from uh, one. Uh, from on, via the H, uh, HTTP protocol, uh, this um, the size of uh, so the size of the information that you're passing uh, across really matters, and in those cases, uh, name value collection is a uh, is a most uh, lightweight collection that you can make use of it, and it takes only strings, really not big complex objects or uh, custom classes. It can handle it handles only uh, key as a string and value as a string. Okay, and each element is a key value pair. It's just a simple key value pair and it is um, uh, it's straightforward. Collections of this type do not preserve the ordering of elements. As I said, there is no sorting or ordering logic that you want to uh, have it. And the if you try to retrieve the values uh, using the for each statement, you can use it, but the order in which the elements are retrieved are not guaranteed to be in the same order. So it really doesn't matter in which order they are. So that's what the bottom line is. Uh, so the capacity of the name value collection is the number of elements the name value collection can hold. It's not 16 by default like a sorted list or 8 by default for an array list. Uh, it is the number of elements that it's going to hold. So that's again making it very lightweight um, in terms of the number of elements. In the previous case, uh, if it allocates 8 uh, elements uh, for one a physical element, so the remaining seven elements are actually sitting idle, right, and not used. So that have some impact on your memory again. So this is not the case with the name value collection. Okay, so name value collection is pretty straightforward. It's it's got always the number of elements. Uh, the capacity is always equal to the count. Okay, so it's going to automatically increase the uh, uh, the the collection internally. And the hash code provider dispenses hash codes for keys in the name value collection. The default hash code provider is the case insensitive hash code provider. And uh, we did talk about the hash codes and if the, there are various providers. Uh, 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 the case insensitive hash code provider is uh, going to ensure that the um, the elements use only case insensitive, which is, that means the case uh, is not uh, case specific. And the comparer uh, determines whether the two, uh, two uh, if you, for example, this is useful only when you know, really make uh, the dot equals uh, calls, not for the storing the elements, right? Uh, whenever you make uh, compare uh, two elements uh, within, uh, or you look for dot contains, uh, it's, uh, contains, you want to search for a given element within the, uh, within the name value collection, then uh, it's going to compare two elements, right? So in that case, it's going to make use of these providers to compare and determine whether uh, the given key exists in the in the collection or not. And for that, it make use of the case insensitive hash code provider and also case insensitive comparer. That means uh, if, you, if you have a capitalized uh, keys and you pass a small key value to compare, it's going to give you the result out uh, saying it, ma it found a match. Uh, it's not going to do a uh, case uh, match. 
and a null reference or uh, nothing in Visual Basic is allowed as a key. So if you remember, uh, sorted list or the uh, hash tables cannot have a null as a key. Uh, whereas here you can have a null as a key, doesn't matter. So a lot of uh, lightweight uh, uh, when, when it comes to the name value collection and it is widely used in ASP.NET um, implementation itself. As I said, the ASP.NET uh, HTTP headers are a name value collection and all this query string is a name value collection um, and so on. So it's uh, widely used in ASP.NET. And that's the reason, uh, this is again a specialized one and uh, the reason to show you, uh, cover this one among the many others is that. Okay, so this is a, a code snippet which is bit lengthy and clumsy here, but um, I, I don't want to split into two, two different slides, but yeah, but don't worry, this is not that complicated to really understand or you know. Okay, how do we, we just want to cover the code here and then we go on, jump on to the um, code execution. So name value collection is a pretty um, um, class name and of course this is available in system.collections.specialized and uh, yes, it has a default constructor here, it doesn't take anything, it is plain, plain vanilla, it's, it takes the same add method which takes two uh, two arguments, uh, both are strings, straightforward. In this case I have chapter 1, 2, 3 and have some .NET system namespaces here uh, and the and the next statement says the reads the elements using the uh, all keys here if you, if you remember uh, you can actually read the values either using uh, the keys uh, uh, which is uh, index, either using by index or using the for each statement. So these are the two flavors, uh, the print keys and values, and print keys and values are two. Oops. Two flavors of it, and we'll see those two flavors here. The first flavor here uh, is using using the for each statement, uh, using for each statement. How we are doing it, it has a special um, member says all keys and the key is a string of course and, and iterating through the keys and uh, bringing the output. Okay, so we did see the uh, the kind of formatter we have here, um, 0 comma minus 10 which is the uh, tabbed index of spaces like uh, spaces that you're going to provide here and uh, the value followed by. So that's the formatter providing the key and value combination here. So chapter 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and the values here. And the uh, we have the key value here because the key value is read as from the all keys. The all keys gives the all the collection of keys and from the collection of the keys we're using the for each statement. And using the key we are retrieving the value from the collection. So this is the my name value collection that is uh, that is passed as a parameter, and uh, within the brackets, uh, within the within the square brackets, we have the key as passed to retrieve it. It is just and nothing but an indexer, right? If you remember, uh, indexer in in the early examples, we have the number as an indexer, and in this case, we have a text or a string as an indexer. So, so that's one thing too. Point. <clears throat> so the second example, how it's reading? It's just two ways, right? So the first case is the for each statement. The second one is the using the indexer. So using the indexer, we have two special methods here. One is the get key. Another one is a get. So get gives the um, value out of it, and whereas get key is straightforward, it gives the key out of it. And of course the indexer. So we are printing that out um, with the index um, in the first zeroth position is the i, which is the i value, which is the indexer we are going to use. And the uh, second argument, which is uh, number one, is your get key, right? And the third argument here, the, the third placeholder is the value itself. Okay, so that's the right line um, we have here. So this is using the for, another one is using for each. Okay, hope that's pretty clear. 
And uh, if you want to access any of the elements directly using the indexer, the way we did here, um, with the uh, with the index that uh, so the, this index is different from the. Um, uh, of course, it's actually not that different. It's the same. Uh, sorry that. Uh, so get key in this case uh, uh, using the index here. So the same thing we can make use of it as a um, index and access that element directly. So my name. This is the same way. If you remember, the arrays are accessed. So it's the same way you can access. It. Again, if you remember how we this how this is possible. This is possible using the the indexer implementations using the, this keyword. If you know, this is uh, uh, indexers are the properties, uh, special properties, um, uh, which are driven using the this keyword and also uh, having the indexer uh, as a parameter. And the second place uh, we have, we can also pass the key. In this case, it's a number of the which position in the, in the second case, it is, is the key value that you are passing in. In this case, this is the key that we are passing in, right? So chapter three. So again, in the in the earlier case, we are actually uh, taking the uh, position for uh, the, uh, the, uh, the number one index in the collection. So there's two ways that you can retrieve the value out. Okay, so the index one contains the value uh, system.txt, which is this one. Remember, collection is zero based, so zero is chapter one and one is chapter two. So that's what one uh, written system not text. And similarly chapter three when you retrieve it it has system dot IO so which is system dot IO chapter three. So you can retrieve using the key value. Okay. And another thing which we have seen so far is a uh, copy two. Okay, it's so a copy two implementation. How we can make use of copy two and how it is different from clone, right? So when I say clone, a clone does a shallow copy. It just copies a whole uh, array to a new array. Um, and whereas copy two, a copy two can be used copy from a given index. Uh, in this case, we have uh, a, an array of string local, my str array, uh, and it is created instance of it passing the size of the name value collection. If you see the count is the uh, property used to uh, re, uh, define the size of the string array. And we are using the copy to method of name value collection and passing the string array and passing the index from which you want to copy. So in this case, we want to copy from zero, right? I, at the same time, I can even give specify an index here, like start only copy from the third index to the end. Okay, I can pass three here to copy only the first, uh, the starting from that given index. And it copies all the values into the array string, the values, okay? And uh, the, uh, the string array, we can iterate using the for each. And, uh, and another format here I have is slash t. Slash t adds a tab in front of um, the placeholder, which is val. So val is going to replace with the um, zero here. Okay, so how does the output looks like? The output looks like this. So this is a copy of all the values in my collection, right? Um, this is in the same order, collections and data. So that's what the output of my copy do. So I can even copy from a given index, as I said. Okay, so the next, what's next? So these are the various uh, methods available in the name value collection, and of course the copy two is also part of the. Uh, these are all available with any uh, any of those uh, members which implements the I dictionary uh, interface, I believe. And uh, remove is available with uh, any other collection. Uh, we're just uh, walking through them uh, to mix. Uh, so in this case, remove a given key in the collection. So it's going to remove it. So in this case, we remove chapter four. So we get. Uh, the remaining list with our chapter 4 and similarly demo. Of course the last one is clear when you do clear that means uh, you just clear the whole um, array <coughs> so nothing is left over it. And in this case uh, yep we are done with this and uh, we are talking about the name value collection right so we're going to talk about this. Okay, so name value collection, it's so straightforward again, adding the values to it and uh, 
we're going to straight away run this code the same code snippet that we have walked through just now and once you clear after I clear there is of course there's nothing to show there and that's what happened here and uh, after removing chapter 4 we have um, 1 2 3 5 but there's no 4 although we have added 4 in this earlier we have 4 and uh, yes this is straightforward right so there is nothing complicated so we'll move on Okay, so now comes the generics. Um, we'll uh, wind up the uh, collections uh, today uh, with the generics topic. Uh, as I said, generics is a very, very important, uh, at the same time, a little uh, fussy. In other words, uh, it's really simple. It's not too complicated unless you understand it. Okay, so I'm trying to put it in a simple way here. Um, and uh, very limited text again and a very limited examples uh, um, so that uh, you don't uh, really get confused with multiple things okay so um, so here's the overview of a generics generics are again uh, FYI it's part of the collection family okay but the, uh, a special type of classes uh, collection classes uh, which are specific and uh, so far what we have seen um, there are a lot of advantages and we have seen so far um, and we'll see some of the disadvantages with the collections that we have seen so far and how to overcome those and uh, what is all about generics for. Okay, so uh, the generics is a topic that is introduced in um, uh, C Sharp 2.0. That's the first thing, it's not available in 1.1 um, or 1.0. Uh, it's available only from 2.0 okay and uh, generics allow you to define type safe data structures without committing to actual data types so that's a, a very good statement and probably you'll understand it better when you, when you see the last slide of this topic uh, what it really means is a uh, type safety you know um, .NET is all always talks about type safety at the same time it still has uh, something called object okay so when you say object that means it represents everything in in the language but still uh, it is type safe when, when we talk about type safety it all means that you ensure that you handle a given data type only so that all means the type safety for example if you declare a variable of type integer uh, that variable ensures that it can handle only integers, nothing else. That's what the, uh, and, and ensures that .NET is a type safety. But since we have object as a, a another type uh, from which all of the .NET types, irrespective of uh, value type or reference type, um, they all actually uh, can be converted into the dot type. So uh, irrespective of any class you write all the classes so uh, the root class the root class is object irrespective of your knowledge or with with your knowledge or without your knowledge it is uh, object so that makes uh, your collections whatever whatever we have seen so far uh, make them as not a type safe collections the one of the first slide if you see uh, one of the first slide in which uh, we did uh, talk about the error list. In this example, we did have a very good example here. We did really explore the capabilities of having uh, the object here. So in this case, uh, we're able to add a string. We're able to add a custom class, which is person here in this case. I'm able to add an integer here. I'm able to add a floating value here, a, a, a double value here, indicating the max or double, right? So, and also a short value here. So, it, it's pretty much open for a, a value type or reference type or anything. So, it can, you can add anything there. So, that means your collection is not a type safe. Okay? What are the implications because of this? The straight up implication implication in this in this case in this example is if I do a sort on this collection, it's going to fail. 
simply fail because sorting need to compare identical data types uh, that you are receiving or in the in the other example which wherein we have a implement a custom comparer right uh, in the other example that we have discussed today let me go back yes so the the sorted list with default and the sorted list with custom right so in this example also we have seen that um, we are trying to add uh, only person type here but can you can this sort list ensure that you allow adding only person there no i still can add integers there or any other classes there anything but if I do that, then my comparison again fail because my comparer is always looking for person only. So although I have written a type safe uh, implementation here, uh, my sorted list is still not a type safe because I cannot guarantee that uh, this list can handle only persons, right? So that's the drawback there. And that's when uh, the generics are more type safe. So we have introduced something to have some flexibility and that flexibility leads to another problem and that problem need to be fixed and we have another X which is called generics. Okay, so the generics is all about that and it refers to the C++ templates. It's uh, if any one of you are C++ programmers and walk through templates, they are uh, similar in concept. Conceptually, they are similar to C++ tem templates, but they are far, far superior to C++ templates. Okay, so we, we, you will understand, because again, see, uh, um, the generics, again, they are completely object-oriented programming. Uh, when you have a class implemented, you having a generics implementation, they are, they can be extended using your inheritance hierarchy, you can have overloaded members, overriding, everything is possible. And uh, in those terms, uh, generics are uh, rich in C, C sharp and of course it's available in VB dot and as well and uh, generics problem statements so that's where we all start right the number one pro number one problem is performance how does the other classes impact in performance so in the earlier example right when we see uh, the error list okay so when you read the error list if you remember the concepts of uh, boxing and unboxing that we have discussed in the um, in the fundamentals. So the boxing uh, comes into play whenever there is a value type and a reference type uh, scenario comes in. So wherein uh, uh, it takes object here, right? Object is of type, reference type, but if you pass a value type as a, in this case if I pass a value type, that was because the signature is a of type reference type, uh, it will do it implicit boxing. So it's going to convert the value type to a reference type and will let you work. Although it is like uh, it allows you to work smoothly, you don't have to do really a conversion here to convert this uh, to a reference type and do it. Implicitly, it's actually converting your value type to a reference type. And same thing happens with all of these collections. Uh, same thing happens uh, wherever you see the object as a key. So in, in this example, we are passing integer, right? So we are passing that into object. So the boxing took place when you're adding a value. So whenever you're retrieving that value out, the unboxing takes place, wherein the, the value inside the, uh, 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 inside the object uh, is converted to a value type and written out. So that's the boxing and unboxing. And again, why boxing is expensive and why unboxing expensive? That goes back to the fundamentals of uh, stack and heap because value types memory area is a stack and a reference type memory area is a heap. And you know what is a stack? We have seen a stack as a collection which is in a uh, last in first out um, implementation wise and the stacks are, um, are, are, are are very fast to access at the same time uh, they are limited 
uh, if your objects are too heavy then they are not good to be in stack they need to be going to heap so that's why all the reference types are, are in heap and again the whole story goes by whereas garbage collection can work only on the heap not on the stack and so on so there are a lot of differences which we discussed in the previous uh, sessions and so if you converting a value from a stack to place it in a heap it's all uh, moving values or data from one memory allocation to another memory allocation which is a completely different type of memory allocation again so stack operates in a different way and heap operates in a different way when a value type is converted to an object the value is actually having a big chunk of memory allocated in the reference type and again the con when you do the other way around um, you're actually taking the value from the uh, from the heap and making uh, uh, dropping that into the stack so in that case what happened uh, the object that is already there in the heap becomes a garbage so in um, uh, unboxing there is a lot of garbage creating at the same time the IO throughput IO, uh, IO operations on the memory is also increasing so that's the reason why boxing and unboxings are a big performance killers and uh, all the because the boxing and unboxing happens implicitly you need to be aware of uh, what is happening like this in this case so far we really uh, did not pay much attention to uh, what's happening right so this is what happens uh, although it takes any data type it is designed to be very flexible to take any data type but internally uh, it's going to be very expensive uh, when you handle a large number of data okay and all these uh, data types take objects right in this case again it's an object and uh, yeah so again the, the stack also takes an object so that's again a uh, base problem is the performance issue um, because of unboxing and boxing and the next one is the type safety issue so we already covered what is a type safety right because it is um, an object it can take anything right so in this typical simple example if you see okay the stack uh, is instance is created we call, call the push and add an integer to it okay and when I'm reading this out, I'm trying to type cast that value to a string. Okay, um, so this uh, type cast will fail because uh, this is actually returning returning a integer, and I'm trying, trying to type cast to int. So the root of this problem is because the push takes any type, any any type of data type. So this is going to be good as long as I pass string to my push. If I by mistake if someone pass uh, another data type, then this type cast will fail. So your program at runtime is going to fail. So that indicates the fundamental issue of uh, type safety. Okay. So these are the two problems that are very base to the all the classes, uh, all the collection classes that we have seen so far. And what is the problem? So how can you fix this problem? There are ways, of course. You can actually uh, make them type safe, right? So you can actually override uh, the add member and make sure that it takes only a given type. And you, of course, you can do this way. How can you do this? Uh, in this case, okay, the, if you want to make the stack as uh, accepts only integers, okay, only integers, I can always define this way, right? I can make uh, have a local collection and implement push pop on my instack this is my completely custom implementation I'm not making use of the existing stack class so I just make my own implementation and uh, and I'm going to use it the same way so it, it always ensures that it takes only integer no issue with the type casting okay good so similarly I can write my own string class string and whatever XYZ boolean or double or whatever I can do right so what's happening here so we're actually introducing a new problem called the productivity so um, there's nothing called you're writing the same algorithm to handle the stack right a push and pop and you're writing 10 different or 20 different uh, custom classes to handle a given data type or a specific data type in other words, you're writing 10 different flavors of the overloaded members. Okay, so you're actually 
not making reuse or not making use of this same logic to fit any given data type. So that's again a productivity issue. For example, if there is something wrong with your logic uh, in a push, you forgot to do something and you want to apply that fix. So where are you going to apply? You want to apply everywhere for each and every data type that you have written for. So that's fundamentally a problem, right? So it's a maintenance problem or, uh, or uh, it's the code is itself is repetitive, that means it's not reusable code, that itself is a problem. So reusability is the main thing that we're going to achieve. So now we go a little back. So now we read the statement again. So type safe define a type safe data structures which is type safe right um, type safety is one of the key thing here so generics can be used to define the type safe data structures without committing to actual data types so that means in the second scenario to address the problem I'm actually trying to bind my class to a given specific data type in or uh, in this case and I can put string so on so generics is a problem solver um, for all these three Okay, so how? Gentrix allows you to define type safe classes without compromising type safety, performance, or productivity. So all those three issues uh, can be solved. So that means you write the generics class once and use that class for any given data type. Okay, don't mistake. Uh, this any given data type means it's not object. Okay, so you can actually, we'll see more. So to do that uh, we can actually, uh, so it's like implement only one generic server, that means one generic class, while at the same time you can declare and use it with any type. So declare and use it with any type, that means when you declare uh, or when you create instance of that generic class, at that instantiation you specify which data type you want to make use of it and henceforth that collection will handle only that data type so it's not object again so we will you will understand more when we see the code so this is how it is so how we how do you do that how we do that using the angle brackets uh, open and close and then closing a generic type parameter so in this case uh, this is a generic type so i have the class stack which takes T as a parameter. Okay, this is a T, and whereas T is a type parameter that you can pass in. Have you ever seen this kind of uh, syntax so far when you did, when you did with the class declaration? No, right? So we actually uh, have a class name only. There's nothing followed by, and uh, we have the constructor implementation on top of it to take care uh, additional parameters, right? So the generics, when you see the uh, angle brackets, wherever you see the angle brackets with the definition of the class itself, that means that's the generic class implementation. So that's the syntax, uh, syntax wise, uh, that's the indication of a generics class. Okay, this T, is it always need to be T? Can't it be M? Who knows? Let's see. Um, so the stack is a type parameter. So in this case, um, T is all referred within its implementation. It is just like a parameter, right? If you see, if you carefully observe, it's just like a parameter without any type, any specific type. T can be int, T can be uh, again object, T can be person, T can be tree, T can be cup, anything. So it, it's a type parameter. That's why it's called a type. The parameter that doesn't have a type defined when you write a generic class and the rest of the things goes around the same way you have a uh, items uh, local local array, local array created using the t and you have the t passed as a parameter to push you return a t as a pop okay so the implementation goes on uh, so everything relies on t and this t at runtime is defined based on the value that is passed in. Okay, it's not too complex. If you look at, all you need to memorize is that the angle brackets and a type parameter. 
and the rest of the body of your class uh, will rely on this T. Okay? And uh, yes, so when you make use of this collection, right, so how do you do that? Okay, so if you see this, this is my stack class, right? I want to, to see both the ends. Yes. So this is how you can make use of it and make it type safe again. So the algorithm or the logic of this class will be only one. So that means you define this class for any given type. In this case, a stack is an operation. So I'm going to have a push and pop implementation here. And uh, I'm just making it generic to fit into any type. It's not object. Okay, object is, has a big implications we have seen. And um, how it's going to be type safe? It's going to be type safe when you're going to declare or create instance of it. Oops, okay, this is what I wanted. Point two. Okay, uh, so that int data type you pass in when you create the instance of it. And similarly, in this case, when I'm I'm making this stack, uh, this instance, right? OBJ int stack. OBJ int stack is a type safe collection, wherein this will take only integer values when you use it. When you push it, you cannot pass any other data type other than the one that you uh, refer to when you create an instance of it. Similarly, this can take only strings. So when at the time of uh, a declaration or instantiation, you specify which type you want to make use of it. So the push pop mechanism will work uh, on the given data type. It sounds good, right? So in this way, I can make my collection type safe. I'm not doing a boxing unboxing here. I'm straight, uh, straight, straightforward passing in and to ensure uh, that how I'm handling string here, int is a value type again, and string is a reference type, right? So, uh, how, how is it handled inside the stack? We'll see. Okay, is it really making use of um, uh, the object or not? Okay, so for now, we'll see the demo. Okay, so we'll cover this quickly and uh, little, I will, I will uh, probably little speed up because again this is uh, not that complicated. If, if you think it is really complicated then let me know. I can, uh, I am ready to repeat it again and again till you get it. Okay, so this is where we are at the last and I want to take this off and uh, okay, the generics. Okay, this is a generic stack implementation I have written here, uh, which uh, is again, okay, if, if you're just having an array here, a T array of N items, and N items is a, a variable of type T array, and if you see, it's not object, it is T. That means the, uh, the array is going to be uh, created based on the data type that you pass in T, okay? and uh, rest all implementation goes in, which is stack, you can pass the initial size here. Uh, again, we don't want to pay much attention there, and push and pop behavior, if you know, the push will add an item to it, and that means so when you add an item, it's going to add only at the top, not at the bottom, so it's going to, this logic ensures that you are adding item to the my local uh, collection, uh, passing the uh, uh, the stack pointer, the M stack pointer is always uh, tracked uh, using the incrementing and decrementing here. Whenever I'm popping up, I'm decrementing the pointer here and I'm returning the uh, item out. So nowhere you see object here. So it's all based on T, right? Uh, T is passed, the T is again a very dynamic data type. So that's why it's called a type parameter. Okay, remember T is called type parameter. and um, Yes, well, you're making use of it. Uh, we are making uh, integer here, passing integer here, that makes this type safe. And again, uh, this collection, OBJ string stack, uh, when I'm making it uh, with string, it makes, again, type safe to handle only strings. First, we'll see the happy path, if really this one works or not. And then we'll see the negative, um, not negative, but the um, other shades of the example. Uh, in this case, it works really good. In the first case, it's picked out the number one, and the second case, it is one So that means it works for the integer and works for the 
a string okay and now let me ensure that it is really type safe okay let me check adding uh, one one okay my caps lock is on okay so is it a valid statement let me compile and see no what is, what is the error says so it's a, just a type safety check it is doing so cannot convert uh, a string to int so it's actually type safe right and it ensures the type safety but the class is same stack and this is the same stack but it is taking string in this case because while declaring this class I ensure that this need to be a string data type okay so we'll see the other way around here can I can it take hundred no it's the same error which says um, <coughs> fail to convert into two string right so this check ensures uh, that yes it is really a type safe collection so uh, if you compare to my old stack uh, stack takes object it can take anything so it works with anything so this will ensure that it's going to be taking the given a uh, data type okay that's good and the next check okay why is this you might even think why is it T is it always need to be T it can't be M let's check I made this M and another thing I want to highlight here uh, with the Visual uh, Studio the capabilities of Visual Studio are editing uh, editing options right so this is a type parameter T and I changed to M okay I wanted to pay attention to the uh, the small uh, square in a different color if you see at the bottom here and highlight there okay and open it it identified that I renamed T to M okay so because T has been used throughout my code if I just said this it actually renamed all the places where the T is I really don't have to go and search for T and rename it to T so that's again a good tip for you uh, if at all if you have any variable that you are um, making use of it change it and uh, you don't have to really worry about where all it's going to impact just rename it using this uh, mechanism and of course I need to recompile it to see it works yes it works so it doesn't need to be a T it can be M as well also and is it always need to be a single character let's see I'll say um, T Y okay so again I have this uh, pop-up just place your cursor there for a while and still you see this pop-up uh, and then you can uh, hit it be a little patience it might not appear quickly uh, but it will appear uh, try to move your cur uh, your mouse pointer nearing that uh, square and you will see this and the second option of course it will let you to preview where it need to stay and then uh, you can preview where all it's going to change right so here 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 are all the places that it identified this has been used and you can actually take, take a, a code view as well and then finally when you're when you're sure you're good or if you want to skip a couple of them you can uncheck that part and then apply okay so it's very intuitive uh, for renaming okay so it takes three character word yes it takes it does it work yes it works so it doesn't matter so it can be um, uh, any name there so only thing is uh, T is a standardized one which always refers to a uh, type parameter so if you see any uh, uh, built-in generic classes so you have an identical uh, generic stack uh, generic uh, queue a generic uh, sorted list and so on uh, the all the collections that we have seen so far are available uh, as a generic version also again you don't have to really write a stack logic the way I have done here uh, there is a generic version of stack also available 
I'm just giving this as an example. So if you want to have your own uh, collection class, for example, I have been showing the person as my uh, class. So if I want to have a, a collection class uh, that handles only person uh, as a collection, then I can uh, use the same way. Okay? So I can uh, uh, implement a generic class which accepts only person. So we'll see more of that, okay? So this is the uh, overview of the uh, generics class. And uh, throughout my program, uh, I've been making use of the T. Um, and uh, nowhere, we are actually making, uh, uh, we are ch checking that this is specific to this uh, uh, typecasting and making specific again. So I'm nowhere I'm trying to convert this T to an integer and checking the value if this is an integer or not. I'm not doing that. So you should always avoid doing such kind of things uh, because the generics are generic by name itself is again it is for open use so what are the logic you're trying to put in uh, the uh, generic class need to be uh, for a variety of data types based on that based on the use that you're doing so it should not be specific to a given data type so always don't try to convert the T into a specific data type and checking whether this is a, a type. Then in that in that case, you cannot uh, make your class generic. That means in this case, if it is, the, uh, I'm able to pass integer. I'm able to, able to pass string because this is generic, and the operation of stack is important here. So stack as a push and pop mechanism. So that is important, uh, not the uh, 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 values that you are passing in. Okay, so when you implement these uh, generic classes, you need to keep it in mind that the uh, the logic that you put in is is generic enough to handle any type of data types. And the of course, again, so there are certain uh, constraints apply uh, in case like really I don't I don't want users to pass int. I don't want you. Uh, I don't want whoever making use of it uh, uh, create uh, uh, an instance of this passing int or passing the string okay so you can restrict them you can actually if you want to have a uh, a person collection in my case person collection accepts only person well, fine you can do that uh, those are the kind of constraints that you can apply so we'll see that okay so hope you're clear it's pretty simple not that complicated only thing you need to remember the the angle brackets uh, that goes along with, alongside and uh, when you create a generic class. This is a custom implementation of your uh, class. So the next is the uh, generics constraints, uh, uh, as I said. Um, so in this case, what happens, uh, the C-sharp generics, the compiler compiles the generic code into an intermediate language, and it's available as, a, your code is available as an IL, and it can be used by anyone, uh, whoever have access to it. Uh, as a third-party DLL or something. So, but how do you enforce people use it the way you have designed it for? Uh, in a simple example, as a person collection, I have designed my generic class uh, to ha to play around with the person data type only because I'm in a person. I'm specifically working some logics on ID and name. So uh, I want to make it as a type safe. Uh, in this case, how do you enforce people? Uh, uh, pass only person as a data type to it. So in that case, we'll, there are uh, three ways you can do it. The first way, uh, for the first constraint uh, is the uh, de derivation constraint. So derivation is again goes back to the how you derive uh, from one class to another class, right? In this case, you make your uh, <coughs> uh, generic class using a where keyword to reserve the given, uh, to apply the given constraint. So in this case, uh, how do you do that? We'll see in the next slide, but for now, we'll see just uh, the high level types. The number one is the uh, derivation constraint. Number two is the constructor constraint. Uh, in the constructor, you can also enforce that uh, uh, you must have uh, uh, this specific constructor, uh, either a given set of parameters. In my uh, given example, if I say person, it takes a it takes a two parameters as a default constructor, right? You must make sure that's one public uh, parameterized constructor or a default constructor should be available. Uh, only classes having that 
uh, need to be uh, are eligible to be passed as a uh, data type to the generics that way also you can enforce based on the constructor and the first case is based on the uh, derivation or based on the classes that derive from a given class right and the last one is the reference or value type it is at a high, very high level or whether you want to take only a value types or a reference types uh, that you can achieve using the struct or uh, class keywords and for constructor you can actually use the new keyword how are we going to make use of this let's see in code first is the derivation constraint so this is principally uh, a stack of t using the where keyword we are specifying that uh, t should be uh, derived from uh, i serializable interface so that means uh, this stack can take only the classes that uh, inherit from i serializable interface and have implementation of it I can even have uh, a class here or anything. So all um, is the der derivation wise, uh, you ensure that you take only the <coughs> classes that inherit from that. And in this case, uh, the my person class, for example, uh, I have to inherit from my serializable interface to match my st uh, st uh, stack, uh, generic stack. And of course, I have the same old ID name, and it has the default, uh, uh, not default, but it has a parameter as constructor, and a print method, and along with the get object data, which is the I serializable implementation, right? And the while well, usage wise, I'm actually passing the creating the stack of person, and of course, new person, and I'm actually pushing with the instance of a new person. Okay, so my stack logic is stand same. There's no change in my stack logic the way I had in the previous case. But here I'm, I'm just enforcing to take only the objects, uh, only the classes that implement I serializable interface. We'll see the quick demo. Hope that's again uh, clear enough. Uh, it's not again complicated. We're just in applying the constraints. Uh, in this case, the derivation constraint. Okay, and we'll see the happy path here, and we have a, a stack, which is the same stack, and the um, same stack, same code, no change in that, except that uh, it is making use of the uh, derivation constraint, and uh, the stack is de just decorated with where t is serializable, and the person I have to uh, implement the is serializable. Uh, and uh, of course implement the I serializable members which is uh, get object in this case I don't have an implementation that's why the default thing is throw not implemented exception since I'm not making use of this uh, I can keep it as is it doesn't matter all it matters is that it implements the I serializable attribute to pass as a argument to it okay and make use of it and I'm reading the value out uh, with pop and pop is actually returning a person p okay and remember if you look at the stack implementation it really doesn't care it is the same t array a push again same thing and pop again same thing so there's no change in the logic so that's what key uh, when you design a generic class the or uh, the 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 algorithm that you write should fit for any data type it should not be specific to any given data type and that's when the richness of a generic class will evolve uh, otherwise uh, this is not going to be uh, any different from uh, a, a hard coding stuff so in this case I'm using making use of the same logic same structure just by decorating uh, with the where clause I'm making uh, my uh, stack to be to take only the classes that implement the IC reliable interface, right? So we'll run this code. We'll add a breakpoint here to ensure that we are running the same code. Yes, uh, it does work. <coughs> and of course, P is part of print. And yes, so I have added uh, 100 and shaker, and I see that out. Okay, which is good. Now we'll see the negative shades, not negative shades, but uh, the uh, more of ensuring whether it's behaving the way it designed to. What I'll do is uh, the first thing, 
since this stack is going to take only the classes that implement IC realizable, I'm going to take this off and see. Will this work? Okay. So it, it doesn't work. So it throws out an error saying um, the IC realizable is implemented or uh, it needs to be um, uh, uh, the implicit uh, reference conversion fail, blah, 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 all that matters is the IC realizable. Okay, so it needs to have an IC realizable to make this code work. Okay, this is step one. And number two, um, I'll take this off. Where class? Compile. Any issues? No issues. Why? Because it doesn't care. When, it, when, this, when this is made like this, uh, what ma what matters here is it doesn't matter to be T be any type. It can be value type or reference type, doesn't matter. In this case, what I can do is I can go ahead and uh, add anything else. In this case, I'll just make it my old of int. I'll say int stack and uh, pass int. Oops. Int and in this case, uh, can I pass uh, this? Let's see. Oh, let me first rename this. Oops. Okay. I'm not waiting for the automatic thing to pop up because there's not much of it. Okay, and of course, and this is int. Okay, so now what's happening? it is breaking two places because this is taking only int. It cannot take person, right? So that's where it's breaking. So I'll pass int to it, right? 110. And this is person, so it is, that's why it's failing. So I'll make this as int. I say, I'll say int i, and of course i doesn't have a p dot print, so I'll take this off. And now I'll compile. It's good. So now what happened? It is taking int also and person also, right? And now I'll run. I, I did not print int, that's why I don't see it on the screen. Uh, okay. It's running a little more than two hours, so uh, just bear with me. I'm going to wind up in pretty quick. Um, so it might take another 10 15 minutes, okay? Uh, um, I just bear with me. I want to complete this uh, collections topic today. Uh, that's why I just. Uh, Okay, so I'm adding int out. So I'm able to see. So if you, if you see the way, I'm not doing typecasting anywhere, right? So I'm just using a, a custom class here and also integer directly uh, popping up and in just printing. I'm not doing a typecasting, which saves a lot of time, right? So in this case, my collection becomes open to any data types when I remove it. So when I put this constraint back, it's going to break my integer, so it can't take an integer, okay? So that ensures that the constraint really works. Good. And that's the number one constraint. We are good with this, and the remaining two constraints we'll see and we'll wind up for the day. The second constraint is a constructor constraint, wherein we decorate that using the same T um, column and new. This indicates that it should have a uh, one public default constructor. Otherwise, uh, any class that has a public default constructor can be added to the stack. So that's what it indicates. And in this case, I have added a public default constructor for my person. Early, earlier, we don't have this. So I've just added a public default constructor having initializing ID with 999 and name with unknown. Okay. And the logic goes same uh, person. Okay. So this is again. Okay, the constructor wise. Yep. So the 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 code you know, this part won't change. It's the same code I have, and I, only the constraint that I'm adding up is the um, is the new constructor uh, to ensure that uh, uh, the any data type that you're passing in when you create it, uh, when you create declare the stack must have a public default constructor and that's the reason I have added the public default constructor initializing with 9999, right? And now we'll run this code and see. 
good so it works the same way uh, as I know and uh, to see if it is really matters I'm just going to remove this default constructor and build it MC so it's breaks so it's asking for a default constructor right <clears throat> okay this ensures that the uh, constructor constraint works Okay, the next and last one is the reference type or value type constraint. This you can actually have it uh, by just stating that it takes only class. When I say class, that means it can take any reference type. And of course, for value types, it, you just specify that as structure. S T R U C T is the structure is the keyword that you can use. We'll see that also. So this is the structure keyword that you need to specify when you want to make this collection apply only for the value types and if you want to apply this only for the reference types then make it to class and the rest of the code will go same Oops, okay let me open the last code and show you constructor is done and uh, with reference to value type and the reference type so all the other code remains same. Uh, my default constructor is gone again for my person class, which is fine. Doesn't matter here because our constraint is on class. Okay, so the constraint is on class only T class. So uh, I'll run this code to see my class appears correctly so yeah it is running good so I'll try to add any other class <coughs> uh, okay let me see what else I can add I want to make a string string is also a reference type okay let me because I'll just change this and also take uh, only string since so string is also a reference type it should work okay uh, I don't have to uh, yeah fine uh, I can actually write console dot write line because pop is going to give a string directly so I can just print it out directly right so I don't have to make use of this Okay, let me build this. Uh, push, oops, because my variable. Okay, I build it. Yes, it's good, and I can able to pass uh, um, a string to it because string is also a class. Okay, can I uh, make it int? because int is a value type right it doesn't allow me because type int must be reference type so in say it should be a reference type otherwise it can't take okay so that uh, uh, makes it a class what if I just change this to structure so this will need to ensure that uh, it can this uh, collection can be created only for the Refer uh, value types in this case both the reference types are errors okay so good so those are the three constraints uh, that we have um, with respect to generics and that brings uh, to the end of the generics and the of course we have seen this in the last one to go uh, so I'm not preparing any more uh, examples for this because we have seen the dictionary list queue stack uh, which are uh, non generic if you remember there was a non generic keyword uh, when we talked about the, all these uh, uh, classes and these are our generics these are available in system dot collection source generics so these are uh, built for a generic type. So you can have a list of a T. Again, T is, is a type parameter and a Q. Um, again, stack. These are all type um, type parameters. And you know, the, one of the very good example I uh, I like uh, is the. Okay, that's good. So a typical example, right? If you say cup of okay. 
So if you see the real implementation of a cup, uh, it, a cup can hold it, uh, a tea, coffee, horlicks, milk, anything that you put, water, something, right? So those, if you see the tea is again dynamic in nature, it can hold anything in a cup behavior wise, uh, it has a characteristics that can fit into anything. So that's where when you when you write the generic classes, that's the important thing to keep in mind is uh, that the implementation need to go with any type that comes in as a T and that you intend it for, again, based on the constraint that you apply. Okay, so that uh, is what I uh, have for now and we'll continue with the next topics um, in the next sessions. Session 18, we did start with the sorted list, uh, how can we, uh, what are the different uh, interfaces it comes with uh, out of box and we did see how can we do a sorting of the items within our collection, uh, sort list collection, uh, uh, and how can we sort using a default comparer and also we did use make use of a custom comparer to sort these elements within the sort list, sorted list wherein we made use of the iComparer interface to sort using the custom sorter and we did see a name value collection it's very very powerful and useful in uh, especially in the uh, ASP.NET web application wherein your query string and everything is a uh, is our name value collection in general and we did have a deep dive into the characteristics of a name value collections uh, in general and we did extend uh, with a lot of examples of for uh, the name value collections and with a very good demo and also we did jump into the generics with an overview and what are the problems that generics normally uh, address and what are generics and how can we write a generic program, uh, generic classes and we did see various different generics uh, constraints which are classified into uh, derivation constraints, uh, constructor constraints and the reference of value type constraints. So all of that we covered and finally we did uh, end up with uh, a kind of an overview on the dictionary, a generic dictionary of T, T key, T value and a generic list, generic queue, generic stack and with this uh, we uh, uh, with this we wind up the session and continue with the next topics in the subsequent sessions.